And then the new one is like 1100, but like it's only, you know, if I do it every year, it's like a car. And, 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 which, uh, I mean, obviously, like not everybody wants to or can afford to do it, but the advantage is that you're almost always on a pretty new battery. So, like, you know, like people like I have a friend, a colleague who's like, I have an iPhone 11, and it's like, fine. He's like, but it's like, it basically is like a battery by like new. Well, yeah, I'll only approve it. 
a little hockey trophy, and you think, you know. There's a championship game tonight, too. Uh, how, how long do you need to take out from that point? Okay. Uh, Alright, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so now, only our labor negotiations can deal with this. That'd be nice. Tell me about it. <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. Yeah. I'm going to go right there. I, I know. <coughs> Overtime. Yeah. We want what the New York Times got. Excuse me, Dan. No I'm comment. Cool. I'm going to do a briefing, and we're about to do a briefing. Could I do a briefing? Yeah. Fine. He said they offered him 2%. Minor, minor stroke. So he's fine. Resting. I back. wish for you okay. to get the ultimate thing that we got. I don't wish for you. None of us getting under. Nearly three years without a contract. Yeah. That I think we're already at a year and a half. Yeah. 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 We're uh, yeah. we're in the midst of all this. Oh. Oh. If I ever say anything, I'm going to be Next time you're in Vigo Alley in Annapolis, I'll toss you over the board. Well, yeah. Well, some negotiations with the There you go. I I
Attention, the press briefing will begin in two minutes. The press briefing will begin in two minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to apologize for the late start. Uh, the administrator was meeting with the president, giving the president an update, and so we wanted to make sure we had her with us before we came out, uh, given the day. So again, good afternoon, everyone. This morning, Hurricane Idalia made landfall in Florida as a major hurricane. Our administration is prepared to support any needs that may arise as Idalia moves through Florida and into Georgia. Personnel and resources from across the federal government and from our voluntary and nonprofit partners are ready to assist. Later today, the American people will hear directly. They will hear directly from the president. He will speak about our efforts to respond to, her, to, the, to Hurricane Idalia and our, our, our ongoing commitment to help the residents of Maui recover after the tragic wildfires earlier this month as well. But before I turn it over to the FEMA Administrator for an update on Hurricane Idalia, we want to make sure all of those experiencing the effects of Idalia are, or are on the path uh, to make sure that they are staying safe. If you're experiencing hurricane wind, storm surge, and flooding, don't venture outside. Listen to warnings of local officials and shelter in place. Do not enter flood waters since there can be chemicals and debris. If you are in the projected path of the hurricane, please remain alert, closely monitoring any changes in its, to its path. Listen to local and state officials for guidance and evacuation notices and finish your preparedness. The president and our entire administration, our entire administration are committed to supporting all communities impacted by the hurricane. With, we will be with you every step of the way as we have been when we have, when we have to deal with these types of uh, disastrous situation, hurricanes, extreme weather. Uh, this is an administration that will be with this community uh, from before, before it, it started, as you all know, from what you heard from the president earlier this week and also the administrator, the administrator after it hits, and we will be there until they are able to rebuild. With that, Administrator Quizwell, welcome back. 
All right, good morning, everybody, and thanks, Corrine, and, and I'll just jump right in. Um, I did just have an opportunity to brief the President on our current response efforts for Hurricane Adelia, which, as all of you know, made landfall early this morning. While we were in there, the President contacted Governor DeSantis to let him know that the federal family continues to be there to support him. The Governor expressed that all of his needs are met currently, and the President reiterated that if anything is needed from the federal government, we will be able to support, and we have over a thousand personnel currently deployed, prepared to support um, not just Florida, but all of our states that are in the path as needed. Um, while I was in there, the governor also, or the president also directed me to travel immediately into the area, and I will be traveling later this afternoon um, to join Governor DeSantis tomorrow um, to do assessments and see firsthand what the impacts from this storm are, and I can be able to report back to the president exactly what I see, what we think the needs might be, and where the federal family can continue to assist. Before I touch more on Hurricane Idalia, I also want to address um, the second reason that I am here at the White House today. Today, I will also join President Biden alongside his cabinet and agency officials who are supporting the response and the recovery efforts on the ground in Hawaii um, as we continue to help the people of Maui rebuild and recover over the long term. The whole of gov this whole of government approach is what is needed to get the right resources to the people of Maui, the resources and the assistance that they need and that they deserve. Now back a little bit to um, what we know so far on Hurricane Idalia. Uh, while it is still too soon to assess the total damages, we know that the storm made landfall as a Category 3, which means over 120 mile per hour winds and up to 10 inches of rain in some areas. Uh, peak storm surge in some places along the coast. Um, it has peaked right now, but it could surpass once they measure um, over 15 feet of storm surge. And we'll get exact numbers as they're able to go in and assess what the total um, storm surge was. And in fact, Idalia is the strongest storm to hit this part of Florida, to make landfall in this part of Florida in over 100 years. But FEMA and the entire Biden-Harris administration, we were prepared and we were ready to support the needs of this storm. As I mentioned, we have um, actually over 1,500 federal responders that are on the ground in the affected area. This includes over 300 personnel from FEMA, as well as over 500 urban search and rescue personnel ready to support any of the state's requests. As of 7.30 this morning, and I know these numbers are dynamic and fluid, but as of 7.30 this morning, there are nearly 300,000 customer outages um, for power in Florida, and we do expect those numbers to continue to rise as the storm passes through um, and goes into Georgia, and we'll see power outage numbers for Georgia, South Carolina, and perhaps North Carolina. Our partners at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers are pre-positioned to support power restoration, and they have over 30 generators that are pre-staged. Additionally, the utilities are preparing for storm impacts, including pre-staging crews and equipment outside of the projected storm track, and the state anticipates a total of about 30,000 to 40,000 linemen in Florida to begin to assist in the power restoration efforts. People that are still in the storm's path, however, as you heard from Corrine, they should not venture out into the storm and remain sheltering in place if your local officials are telling you to do so. However, if you are in trouble and you need immediate assistance, please call 911. As you do go out, do not wade in the water. Do not drive through flooded roads and streets. Just remember, turn around, don't drown. Unfortunately, we see so many fatalities after the storm passes. We want to uh, make sure that everybody is taking the right precautions to keep themselves safe. And as always, please continue to listen to your local officials as this storm continues to pass over Georgia currently and into South Carolina. Please check on your friends and your family and your loved ones, especially older adults and people living with disabilities to see if they have any needs. In closing, I just want to remind people that this is still very much an active situation. Remnants of the storm are still affecting Florida as we speak. The storm is over Georgia and moving into South Carolina. People there and in the Carolinas will continue to experience impacts throughout the day today and possibly into the weekend. Again, FEMA is well postured with our federal partners to support Floridians during this time of need and stands ready to support other affected states as needed. 
with that, I can take any questions. Thank you. Uh, Administrator, what are you most concerned about over the next day or two since you just said it's too early right now to assess the extent of damage in Florida? Yeah, my biggest concern is those people who chose not to evacuate, and I know that our local first responders, the heroes that are out there in those local communities are doing an amazing job already of going into the areas where people did not evacuate and helping to get them to safety. I think that is our priority through the day today is to make sure that everybody is safe after this storm has passed. As we go into the next few days, we're going to want to assess what the total amount of damage is and see what immediate needs need to be put forth in order to help support and start the recovery process. Uh, Administrator Criswell, thank you so much. Um, could you just take us a little bit into that briefing that you had with the President today? What is he most concerned about? What was he most focused on? Any other direction that he gave to you other than to fly down to Florida? And then secondly, you said that Governor DeSantis is satisfied with the federal response, doesn't need anything additional. Uh, was there anything else discussed on that, on that call? Yeah, the, the President's main concern is making sure that we are, are bringing everything that we have in to support these states as they're um, having immediate response and life-saving needs or beginning to start their assessment and their recovery process. Um, I think it's incredibly important that, that our governors know that, that we are ready and postured to bring in all federal resources to support any of their life-saving and their life-sustaining needs um, in the very near future. Uh, the conversation with Governor DeSantis uh, was that, you know, reiterating the fact that we already have over 1,500 personnel there um, in the area to be able to support. And the governor currently has no unmet needs. Um, but as we begin to assess, right, as the governor assesses and as I get on the ground tomorrow to assess, we'll see what additional needs might be there and if any of those resources need to be employed or we need to move more into the area. Has the president spoken yet with the governors of Georgia or South Carolina as well or any plans for that to happen? Um, I believe he was preparing to contact them after I left so I could come to this briefing. Good job. Uh, thank you. Administrator, to what extent do you attribute climate change as a cause of this storm and the other weather events that we're seeing over the last weeks and months? Yeah, you know, I'm not going to attribute the cause of the storm, but what I can say is that we are seeing an increase in the number of severe weather events. And what we saw with this storm, as we have seen with several of our hurricanes over the last few years, is that they are intensifying more rapidly due to the um, elevated heat of the water temperature in the Gulf or in the Pacific or whether it's in the Atlantic. These storms are intensifying so fast that our local emergency management officials have less time to, to warn and evacuate and get people to safety. This is something that we have to take into consideration as we build our preparedness plans, as our local communities build their preparedness plans on how they're going to communicate and prepare their communities for the types of storms that they're going to face in the future. Secondly, more specifically on this storm, do you have any sense or is it too early now to say what the cost of recovery will, will require? Yeah, it's far too early to even estimate what the cost is. Uh, it's still unsafe in many parts to even go out. Um, that's what's going to happen over the next several days is to really get a good understanding and initial estimate of what we think the costs will be and what the amount of impact to these communities has been. Good. Just to follow on that, with what you've seen so far, how long do you think it will take to get that full assessment and how long will it take to understand the costs of the recovery efforts? Yeah, we have rapid assessment teams that have been pre-positioned, ready to go out as soon as it's safe to do so. And so th those are personnel that will integrate in with the state personnel to go see what the damages are. Um, but we also use technology, right? We use aerial imagery and satellite technology, and we use our geospatial information to get a better idea. So we don't have to physically put people out there, and it allows us to make these types of decisions much quicker than we've been able to in the past. And so, again, it will take several days to get a full understanding of what the initial assessment, uh, damage assessment is, but it will take longer to get the full picture of the total um, amount of impact to these communities. And yesterday you had said that FEMA's disaster relief fund was running low. With what we've seen from this storm so far, there's also the Maui fires. Do you <coughs> think there's enough funding? Are you confident there's enough if there's another extreme weather event in the next month? Yeah, so yesterday, as I announced, I directed uh, my personnel to implement what we call immediate needs funding, and that prioritizes the remaining funding within the Disaster Relief Fund to support those life-saving efforts. Um, I believe through this effort we have plenty of funding to be able to support our ongoing efforts in Maui as well as this event um, to include Florida, Georgia, South Carolina as needed. Um, but we are monitoring it very closely, right? Every day we are looking at what the cost of these storms are as we approach 
um, the end of this fiscal year. And if we have another storm, we're going to have to closely monitor what impact that's going to have and any other actions we might have to take. Uh, Administrator, thank you for being here as we do approach the end of the fiscal year, as you just noted, just getting a little bit down the road. These take weeks, months to recover. FEMA's involvement will go on for quite a long time. Back in 2013, when there was a government shutdown, FEMA had to furlough its non-essential staff right now. What potential impact would a government shutdown, as lawmakers have considerations about whether to fund the government, have on FEMA's ability to care for those in both Maui and in Florida? I mean, we always uh, want to take account to what our personnel are doing and, and how we're using our personnel to support these events. Uh, a government shutdown does not impact our personnel that are funded through the Disaster Relief Fund, and so they're able to continue operating and supporting all of the immediate um, efforts and life-saving efforts that continue to go on. And we also, for our other staff, uh, can designate our, our emergency essential personnel to support any life-saving efforts. And so uh, we have plans in place, as we have gone through this before, on how we would staff our, our agency to continue to support those efforts. And if I can't follow up about the critical needs assistance that was provided to those in Maui, $700 in payments to individuals there, given the cost of living in Hawaii, specifically in the Lahaina community. Is anything being done right now? Are there considerations? or efforts being made to try to raise that cap, that $700 figure for those who are there? Yeah, the $700 figure of critical needs assistance is really just that amount of funding for some of the very immediate needs um, that individuals have. Uh, every year, the, the main part of our assistance, which is our individual and household program, adjusts annually based on inflation. This year, it's $41,000 of a cap that individuals can get. Uh, that will get raised after the um, fiscal year. I, I don't know what that number is yet, but we do adjust that main portion of the funding that goes to individuals annually based on inflation. So 700 is it for now, and then they can pursue those other monies going forward. But if people have run through that money right now, they're on their own until they get access to the further assistance coming. Yeah, and we already have, um, I, I think it was 12,000 individuals that registered for assistance in Maui um, and somewhere um, over $15 million that's out on the street. That number could be higher um, right now from that other program. Thank you. Um, I know that you and the governor and local officials, state officials have all told people they had to get out of the way of this storm. So my first question is, are you satisfied that people heeded those calls, both from you and, and local and state officials? And then secondly, uh, you mentioned the search and recovery teams that are sort of deployed and ready to, to go. What's your assessment so far on what those needs look like if people are sort of stranded right now? Yeah, so on the first question, I think many people did heed the warning, but unfortunately many did not. Right. We're already getting reports of people that chose to stay and they're getting calls um, into the local first responders to come in and assist them. And if anybody needs assistance, they should. They should call 911 and those local uh, first responders will come in and help. Um, as far as the, the entire footprint of those resources that are available, it's a combined effort recognizing uh, the capability that the state already has with all of their resources, and we have additional resources that are integrated in with that operation. So if we need to immediately augment, we have resources that are ready to deploy um, as soon as requested um, without hesitation and without interruption. But is it clear yet how many people may be stranded? Oh, I don't have a number on how many, no. Uh, from the initial assessment, what would you say are the most damaged areas, and uh, what was the response from the population in those areas to the government's instructions? I would say that initial reports um, are in that Big Bend area that have had the greatest impact. They have experienced the greatest amount of storm surge. They experienced the greatest wind speeds. And so when we do get out to start assessments, that would be uh, my anticipation of where we would experience the greatest amount of damage and impact um, across Florida. And how did people respond in those areas? Again, I think many people did heed the warnings, and there was a lot of public messaging that went out there to let people understand that the danger is not just the cone of the hurricane, but it's the storm surge and the water, which is creating and causing the most fatalities in these events. Um, but again, many people did not, as we are hearing about our first responders going in to support rescuing people from their homes that are now stranded. Okay, we're going to wrap, we'll wrap it up we'll way in the back and then edge it to the James, on the immediate needs funding, I'm curious if you have recognized the potential long-term ongoing recovery efforts that could be at risk here. Uh, so if I understand the, the long-term recovery efforts, based on right now or what it looks like going into the next fiscal year? 
going into the next next fiscal year, which ones are at risk here if you do not get the funding you need? Yeah, so what immediate needs funding does is the work does not stop, right? The projects continue to go underway. Our longer term recovery projects for the variety of disasters that we've experienced over the year. The obligation or the reimbursement of the funding for those is delayed into the next fiscal year. Um, if it gets delayed into the next fiscal year, then that just starts us out at a smaller balance of what we had anticipated our needs would be for fiscal year 24. Are there any ongoing efforts though that you've identified that would be at risk if it comes to that? Again, the funding or the work itself does not stop. It's the funding that just gets delayed into the next fiscal year. Could add last question. What did you expect of Hawaii the administrator? Because there's still a lot of questions uh, among officials in Maui and Lahaina and across Hawaii about who was in charge in the hours as the fires burned and then the hours after. You're a veteran local emergency management official. Uh, state emergency management official now at the federal level. How do you assess how officials there responded? Uh, are there lessons to be learned perhaps for other communities? And is your agency prepared to work with congressional Republicans if they launch investigations as they say they will? Um, again, I was not there during the response, and so I would um, be out of line to assess how they responded during the time because I did not experience what they were experiencing. Uh, what the federal government does is we come in and we support their efforts, and that's exactly what we did, and we will continue to support their recovery and their rebuilding efforts as they move forward. Were you being properly briefed by FEMA authorities in Hawaii that would have been working with those officials? Uh, what I was briefed on throughout the time is my regional administrator, Bob Fenton, happened to be uh, in Oahu um, for another meeting, and he was engaging with the team and giving us updates as to the spread of the fire and what the population was impacted and what the potential uh, federal resources would be needed to come help support the initial response and the ongoing recovery efforts. And if congressional Republicans want you or other agency officials to testify about what went on in Hawaii, I'm happy to, to so testify much. on what the federal role was in this process. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. All right. Thank, you. Tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. All right. One, one thing before we continue. Thank again uh, the administrator for, for coming today and yesterday uh, to provide all of you an update. So as Acting Labor Secretary Sue announced today, the Department of Labor is supporting one of the basic tenets of binomics that a hard day work should lead to a fair day's pay. This proposed rule would deliver on the tenant by restoring and extending overtime protections to 3.6 million salaried workers. The Biden-Harris administration recognizes the benefits of a growing economy are only broadly shared when you have politics that empower workers. We'll continue working to build an economy that works for working families. The president and the vice president are committed to ensuring that all workers are paid fairly for their hard work. With that, Darlene, you want to kick us off? Yes, thank you. Um, two questions. First, on Africa, the president had promised in December that he would visit this year. It's now September. A trip has not been announced. Just wondering if today's coup in Gabon, the recent coup in Niger, and others in recent years um, make it any less likely that he will visit? How will those destabilizing events factor into whether he ultimately goes so, or not? So as you asked me about if there's any U.S. concerns, domino effect potentially, as we're seeing what's happening uh, over the last couple of months or so, look, we remain focused on working with our African partners and the people to address challenges and support democracy. That is something that uh, certainly the president uh, is, is steadfast on, which is uh, also the best foundation for development social uh, cohesion and stability in Africa. Uh, President Biden has been clear about the United States' commitment to deepen and expand our partnership between the United States and African countries, institutions, and people as well. We stand with the African people in working towards these goals. I don't have anything to announce about a, uh, about a potential scheduled trip for, for this year. Uh, the President is still very much committed uh, to going to the continent. As you know, the Vice President has been there, the First Lady has been there. Uh, so you've seen a commitment uh, throughout and also other 
other secretaries uh, clearly in this administration. So you've seen a commitment from us for, of the, for the continent. We had a very successful, as you all know, uh, meeting with African leaders uh, just last winter. Uh, that went very well, and that commitment continues. As soon as we have a date and a location uh, clearly uh, laid out, we certainly will share that with all of you. And then a second question closer to home. Will the president stay in Washington this weekend, given what's going on in Florida? We don't know the extent of damage. The week ahead had him leaving on Friday to go home sure. to help. As you just heard directly from the administrator, we do not have an assessment, obviously. She's going to be going to, uh, to Florida tomorrow at the president's direction, and she will be with Governor DeSantis uh, throughout the day. I, I can confirm uh, before coming out here that uh, the president did uh, connect with Governor Kemp, uh, of the, the governor of Georgia, obviously. And so that conversation uh, did, did happen. He's also going to try and connect uh, with the governor of South Carolina. Um, so. As the administrator said, uh, the situation is still very dynamic. I don't have any changes or any uh, additions to the president's uh, travel. You're going to hear from the president directly uh, uh, who's going to speak about the continued efforts uh, to prepare and respond to Hurricane Idalia. Following those remarks, as you all know, he's going to be meeting with his cabinet uh, and agency officials to continue uh, our coordination of federal response. So that will happen. He will always continue to, di to uh, be engaged directly with local elected officials officials. I just, we just mentioned that he spoke to the governor of Florida, uh, spoke to the governor of Georgia. He's going to reach out to certainly other uh, elected officials to ensure they have what they need on the ground, the resources uh, that they need to deal with the impacts, the, certainly the aftermath of this particular hurricane um, uh, when, when we are able to assess and see what, and they are able to see what uh, their needs are. Uh, we, you hear say this often, you heard it from the administrator, you've heard this from, from us. We, this president is committed to being there for the community, uh, for the people who are certainly uh, have been impacted uh, by this hurricane, uh, you know, today, tomorrow, as long as it takes uh, to help them all get back on their feet. So that will not change, obviously. Thank you. Catch up. Uh, thanks, Green. Two four policy questions. Um, the Kremlin acknowledged today that the plane crash that killed uh, Prozhogin may have been a deliberate act. Does the White House have a response to that? So, I mean, I, I was you know, kind of asked this, this question yesterday. Uh, I don't have any new assessment or anything to share uh, with uh, what the Kremlin or, or Russia, the government may have shared. Uh, what we, what uh, I have said yesterday continues to be the case. Uh, it, pre, it seems pretty evident what happened here. Uh, uh, you know, as the president said recently, and I'll quote him, there's not much that happens in Russia uh, that Putin is not, uh, is not behind. And that was not just predictable, but it was predicted. Very same words I used yesterday. So we all know that Kremlin has a long history in killing its opponents. We know uh, how um, how forthcoming and and uh, if, you, if you if I will uh, out uh, forthright Prigozhin was uh, in the in in these past uh, past uh, several weeks or a couple of months. Uh, and so this is not surprising. I just don't have any new assessment, uh, regardless of what the Kremlin or the government of Russia uh, wants to share. Topic: uh, Nigerian police raided a gay wedding and arrested 67 people there um, today. I'm wondering if the White House is tracking that and has a reaction. So this is the first I'm hearing of that. I haven't spoken to our teams here uh, about that particular uh, that particular incident. Um, look, you know, we've been very clear. Uh, the president, when it comes to the LGBTQ community, he is he is uh, has been an ally and supports uh, that community. He will continue to do so. He will always speak out when it comes to uh, any type of humanitarian, uh, you know, mistreatment, even across the globe. And he has always been very forthright in talking to uh, leaders about that as it relates to this particular event. I just don't have a comment for you. At this time. Okay. Thanks, Green. Um, there's a report in Bloomberg that the President, uh, sorry, that the Assistant Secretary of Health has recommended rescheduling marijuana as a Schedule Three drug. Um, I'm wondering if the President would support that move. Uh, and secondly, just where does the President currently stand on the issue of decriminalizing marijuana? So look, uh, the President actually asked the Secretary of HHS and also the Attorney General to initiate uh, the administrative process to review how marijuana is scheduled 
Uh, as you know, the administration process is an independent process uh, led by HHS, led by uh, the Department of Justice, and guided by evidence. So, so, so not uh, going to comment on that. We're going to let that process move forward. Uh, and again, it's going to be an independent process that's led by HHS and DOJ. Uh, so any specifics on that, I would refer you to HHS. And more broadly on the question of decriminalizing, which would be going further than this? I mean, look, he's, he's asking HHS and DOJ to, to take a look at it, to do an initial uh, administrative kind of process or review, if you will. It's going to be an independent process. They're going to uh, certainly uh, use the evidence. The, it's going to be guided by evidence. And so I'm going to leave it to HHS and DOJ to, to move that process. And so we're just not going to comment specifically on that. The president's about uh, just over a week away from heading off to India for the G20. He's scheduled to be in Rehoboth this weekend. Given all of those scheduling concerns, how likely is it that the president would make it down to Florida before heading abroad? Is that a goal of his that you would like to try and get down there before he goes uh, out of the country? So look, don't have any schedule uh, additions or travel uh, to add at this time or to share at this time. Clearly, as you just heard, the administrator is going to go there tomorrow, is going to be with the governor, and that is at the president's direction. Uh, when it comes to any type of travel, as it relates to certainly uh, these types of uh, unfortunate uh, disasters, the president doesn't want to take away uh, clearly from what's going on on the ground. Uh, as you know, the president has a big footprint uh, when he travels, so we want to make sure that uh, the community the elected officials, the local leaders, uh, certainly the people have and get what they need in this time after it is the we have the assessment and we see the aftermath of uh, Hurricane Idalia. So don't have anything to share. Clearly, uh, uh, something that uh, the president always looks forward and always wants to be there uh, for the people who are affected by these types of disasters. And, and certainly you've seen him uh, in many different states uh, be there and talk directly to uh, to uh, Americans who are who are there and living through this moment, uh, but we just want to be incredibly mindful. Uh, this is a dynamic situation, and we want to uh, make sure they have everything that they need at this time. Okay. Uh, obviously, lots of issues facing uh, the president, the presidency this week, but two others that sort of gauge the sense of presidential awareness or involvement. Um, you were asked yesterday about the situation in Guatemala. I noticed the Secretary of State reiterated uh, support for the results there. Is that something that's reached the president's attention, who has expressed a lot of concern about democracy versus <coughs> autocracies in the world? This is a situation two doors down from the United States. Is he aware of it? And would he be willing to meet with Mr. Revelo were he to come to Washington before becoming president? So look, the president obviously is kept up to up to date by his national security uh, council and his uh, his uh, foreign policy advisors on all of any dynamic or any uh, situations uh, globally. Clearly, that is something that the president is is kept kept abreast. I just don't have anything to share on any uh, future upcoming meeting uh, at this time. As you know, we congratulated uh, the new leader uh, and uh, and. Uh, Clearly, all his his election was confirmed by uh, by the certified vote results, uh, and so just don't have anything to share or anything to announce about a potential meeting. You were also asked yesterday about uh, potential White House involvement or at least uh, awareness of the UAW labor situation. How about the Writers Guild, the Screen Actors Guild negotiations? We're at about day 120 plus with the writers, 47 plus with SAG-AFTRA. Uh, these are members and these are companies that have close, at least, political ties to this president. I'm uh, just curious if he's been briefed at all or talked to anybody involved in those, or I mean, when the administration might be talking about I mean, look, regardless of political ties, right, this is a president uh, that, has been, uh, that has been called by uh, many labor folks, right, uh, that he is the, the, the most pro-union president ever. Uh, and so this is a president that believes in collective bargaining. Uh, this is a president that believes certainly uh, of the right of, of uh, workers to strike. We've been very clear about that. And as it relates to the writers and uh, also the actors, we believe they have the right to to be able to uh, to to uh, to you know to to ask for fair wages and fair benefits. Uh, that's why collective bargaining is so important, and we have seen it worked. Uh, over the, even the past several years, uh, while this president has been president during his tenure. So that's what the president's going to continue to call for, for folks to come to the table in good faith, have those conversations, uh, do that collective bargaining that the president supports. Uh, and so I don't have anything else beyond to, to share. Uh, but again, this is the most pro-union uh, president, and this is a, he is incredibly proud of that record. Gets 
In the hours and days ahead, how frequently does President Biden intend to get briefed on the storm? Oh, regularly. Uh, daily. Uh, multiple, multiple times a day. You're going to hear from him in, in a few minutes. You heard the, the um, administrator was here today briefing him. He was here. She was here yesterday in person briefing him. Uh, this is something that the president is keeping a very close eye on, uh, as all of you are, are, are following this uh, very closely. Uh, this is important. It doesn't matter uh, if we are in a... This is not about politics. We should take politics out of any type of disaster that we see uh, that the American people are having to, to suffer or deal with. Uh, and so this is not about politics. This is for the president. This is about uh, being a president, a president for all Americans. And so he is going to be closely watching this, uh, getting updated regularly uh, to make sure that the people in, in Georgia, in, in South Carolina, in Florida uh, are getting exactly what they need. Uh, and so that's going to be the president's focus. Thanks, Trin. Um, I wanted to ask about a possible government shutdown. Some conservatives have been on the Hill have been talking about it not being a big deal, that no one will really notice. Um, can you talk a little bit specifically about what would continue to work during a shutdown and what would stop? So look, I, I appreciate the question. I'm not going to get into hypotheticals. Here's what we know and here's what I have said when I've been asked this question. It is that there's no reason, there's absolutely no reason at all for Congress to shut down the government. There isn't. And uh, this is a question for Congress to answer. Uh, they, this should not be happening. And uh, they should fund these vital, vital government programs uh, for, that the American people rely on. And uh, these are critical needs we've requested. When you think about what we've requested and asked for when it comes to emergency funding, right? Uh, when it comes to uh, what we came to the table uh, for, for uh, when it comes to the budget agreement, this was a bipartisan agreement from both sides. And so there is no reason, no reason at all, uh, that Congress uh, should, be, uh, should be going down the path of shutting down this government. Can, can you confirm, uh, though, at least that federal criminal proceedings would continue in a shutdown, including those involving the former president? That would, you would have to ask the Speaker of the House and Congress on that question. That is not something that I can speak to uh, to hear. I, I, you, I, you would have to reach out to Department of Justice, you would have to reach out to Congress, whatever it is that they're uh, doing on that side. Um, that is something for the Department of Justice to speak to. Uh, that is not something for me to speak to. But I will say that our, when it, as it relates to the engagement that we have been having with the Hill on whether it's the whether it is uh, government funding uh, or any kind of legislative process. Look, we have uh, our OMB director, Shalanda Young, our legis legislative affairs office have been in regular contact uh, with them. We are engaging with congressional members on the Hill, and that's going to certainly continue. I want to ask you quickly, the president, President Biden, <coughs> awarded the Presidential Citizens Medal to two Fulton County election workers, Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss, in the past, a federal judge today, uh, ruled in favor of those women who had sued Rudy Giuliani for defamation, ordering that the attorney, that Giuliani, um, pay sanctions. Just your thoughts on this now that it has been completed, it's no longer in the hands of the courts. Uh, the judge has delivered her ruling. What do you make of that? I'm just not going to comment on that at this time. Okay. Uh, thanks, Doreen. Uh, Senate Minority Leader Mr. McConnell had another <coughs> episode in which he froze while answering questions today. I know the president spoke to him the last time this happened and spoke to him when he has had previous health issues. Um, do you know if the president uh, is aware of this and whether or not he's likely I, to I haven't him? spoken to the president, so I, I, I don't know if he's aware of this. And then secondly, on uh, Labor Day, I wanted to follow up to see if there are any uh, announcements for how the president's going to mark Labor Day this year. And, and just, like, just to step back on, on your question about Senator McConnell, clearly we, we wish him well, uh, a speedy recovery. Uh, as you know, the two of them are, are, have, have worked together and have known each other for some time, uh, but I, I can't speak to a, a call or a conversation. I just haven't asked the president about that. As it relates to uh, Labor Day, uh, clearly that's a day that the president uh, in, enjoys uh, celebrating. Uh, as that it's an important day for uh, the labor community. I just don't have anything to share. Once we get closer to that to that date, certainly we will lay out what the president plans to do. Uh, the, at the beginning of June, the White House <coughs> announced the Education Department was going to be appointing a coordinator to address book bans. I asked the Education Department for a status update and couldn't get an answer. So I'm, since we've got students returning to the classroom now, can you give us an update on when this effort is going to start? 
So uh, that is something for the Department of Education to speak to. I, I don't have an update for for uh, for you at, on that particular question, but I, again, that's something for the Department of Education. I know they're going to announce somebody. I just don't have it right this time. So they are going to be announcing someone. I, I just don't have. I know they said that that was announced that there was going to be a bookstore. I just don't have anything for you at this time. Would it be possible at some point to get a description of what this coordinator has done, what schools they've reached out to, what that outreaches look like? Uh, again, that's for something for Department of Education to speak to directly. Good, Karen. Thanks. Um, New York Governor uh, Kathy Hochul is meeting with Chief of Staff Jeff Science today to discuss migration. Can you tell us a little bit more about that meeting and then I have a follow-up to that? Yep. Uh, so as you just mentioned, we are hosting Governor Hochul uh, today here at the White House to continue our close uh, collaboration and to underscore all the ways in which this administration has supported communities who are, ho who are hosting asylum seekers and ways we are working together to increase access to work authorization so we'll have more to share about the meeting later t today uh, but yes she is indeed here uh, and is going to be meeting with uh, members of the president's team another follow but yeah. will there be a readout of that from the White House uh, we will have more to share uh, later today uh, on the meeting I just don't have anything specific on how that's gonna look like and, and Hochul and other Democrats have been pushing the administration to expedite work authorizations yeah. for asylum seekers who are already here does the administration see that as a viable solution to getting people out of shelters faster so I'm not going to get ahead of, uh, of the conversation that they're going to have I do want to say that DHS met recently with state and local um, uh, this is the assessment team that you've you've uh, heard us announce not too long ago and uh, they met with local and st uh, state officials and uh, to uh, to outline uh, and they outlined nearly two dozen uh, ways or recommendations to strengthen uh, certainly their, their operations uh, the administration uh, across several departments and agencies identified a number of federal sites across New York uh, State for housing uh, additionally the Department of Interior is negotiating a lease of Floyd Bennett Field with the city and state so that conversation that continues to happen again that happened I believe on Monday uh, when it comes to the work authorization look this administration uh, has led uh, the largest expansion as it relates to pathways um, lawful pathways uh, in decades and we are committed to building a humane and safe uh, and orderly immigration system uh, those who arrive through those lawful uh, pathways are immediately eligible to request an employment authorization document that's how that process works uh, as it relates to this con this particular conversation and what has been requested by New York I'm, I'm just not going to, to get ahead of, uh, of the meeting that they're going to have today a couple of follow-ups on the uh, spending questions that you got. Lawmakers are already sort of talking about a proposal that perhaps would be a CR in the December, kind of a shorter-term deal. Is that acceptable to the president? Would he be okay with that? That is something. I'm not going to get into hypotheticals. That is something that uh, Congress uh, Congress uh, sh should kind of decide on. Uh, on the length of a continue, continuing uh, resolution, so that's not something that I defer to them. And then related to that, I know you said that the administration, um, Director Young, others are already engaged with lawmakers. Are, are, has there been an expression of sort of red lines, sort of priorities or cuts or provisions that would be unacceptable to, to President Biden that would not get signed in the law? So look, as I said, we have had continued calls with them, continued engagement with members of Congress to lay out the urgency and the important uh, nature of making sure that we do not shut down and we continue uh, funding the government. That's going to continue. I'm not going to get into red lines. I'm not going to get into hypotheticals from here. Uh, there is no reason for Congress uh, to shut down the government, and we'll be continue to be very, very clear about that. Uh, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Um, there's a new book coming, The Last Politician Inside Joe, Joe Biden's White House and the Struggle for America's Future. Uh, the Guardian has uh, excerpts today saying the president um, has told aides in private that he felt tired, and that explains why there are so few events before 10 a.m. So, so two questions. Is this why we're seeing um, brunch lids uh, in recent weeks? Today we had a breakfast lid. And has the president admitted to you? Wait, that see that tired? last part? So is that why we had a, a breakfast lid this morning? I mean, there, uh, the, the book a is- A what? There was a break, the breakfast lid came to the, the oh. press for the first okay. time. I think we've had some brunch lids in recent weeks as well. So my question is: is So that you a think reflection? we've had those lit because the because of this excerpt? Not because the excerpt. The book is suggesting the president tells aides he's tired. But that's in the excerpt, right? Yeah, and that that's why there've been so few public events before 10 a.m. I mean, that's a ridiculous I assumption to make. I mean, that's a ridiculous assumption to, to make. Go ahead, Peter. Thank you. Um, Eric Adams, the New York mayor, is saying about these migrants uh, in New York City, 
any plan that does not include stopping the flow at the border is a failed plan. So why aren't you guys stopping the flow at the border? We are stopping the flow at the border. If anything, the, what the president has been able to do on his own without the help of Republicans in Congress, something that he had to do on his own again because Republicans refuse uh, to give the funding necessary to deal with a situation, uh, immig a broken immigration system that has been broken for decades. They choose, what they choose to do is play politics, but the, pers the president has put a plan that is indeed uh, the data showing is that it is indeed uh, um, stopping, slowing down the flow uh, of unlawful migration, and that is because of the work that this president continues to do without, without the help of Republicans. Okay, and it seems like the hurricane response so far is robust. Did you guys realize that the initial Hawaii wildfire response was not that good, or is it just easier for people to get help from the White House when the president is not on vacation? So the premise of your question and the way you pose your question, I disagree, just for the record. Uh, so if you talk to, if you were to do your reporting and speak to the governor of Hawaii, the senators uh, of Hawaii, the folks on the ground, they would say that the president reacted in record time when it came to dealing with the wildfires, uh, when it came to dealing and making sure that they got everything that they need on the federal level to deal with what was going on on the ground. Let's not forget there were more than 600 uh, uh, federal employees on the ground already to assist uh, with the wildfires in Maui. So your question is, is wrong, it's flawed in many, many ways. And I would, I, would, uh, I would advise you to go speak to the governor and the local and state officials in, in, uh, in Hawaii. Thanks, Kay. Uh, uh, Putin is uh, supposed to visit China in October. This is the first visit, if it happened, this is the first visit after a warrant of his arrest has been issued. What do you make of that? Uh, I'm just not going to speak to Putin's travels. I, I was kind of asked this question yesterday. It doesn't change. I'm not going to speak to his travels. Uh, one more question on Russia. I know, it, I understand you don't want to comment on the Gaussian uh, plane incident, but Many U.S. officials went on the record and said having him march toward Moscow, uh, it was a sign of weakness. Now, killing him, does that reflect a sign of strength in your assessment? I mean, I, I've answered the question. I mean, the president basically said there's not much that happens in Russia that Putin is not behind. I mean, you know, this, is, uh, this was not just predictable, but it was predicted. We have said, uh, we know that when it, the Kremlin has a long history, a very long history in killing its opponents. Uh, so I think we've been very clear here about, uh, about, uh, about our thoughts. I'm just not going to, I don't have any new assessments. I don't have assessment to make, but there's a history here. So I'll leave it there. Go ahead. Thanks, Kareem. Um, I wanted to go back to the question that are we were answering about legal pathways for migrants and the work authorizations. Um, when I've spoken to advocates, people who work with parolees when they arrive in the United States, sponsors, the number one thing they say is how long it takes to get work authorization. Um, I didn't hear you talk about necessarily what you're doing to speed that up, given that you've opened these pathways so that people can come here temporarily from certain countries. So just to give, give a little bit of how this works, uh, the process uh, for applying for asylum and applying for an employment authorization based on asylum applications uh, is established under current immigration laws and can only be changed by Congress. That's how this process works. The law established a 150-day waiting period to apply for work of authorization and an, an additional 30 days to be eligible for approval. That's how the process works. Again, this is something that Congress put forth, uh, and the only way that it can change is with, through Congress. And have you asked Congress to work on that? Well, we've had, had asked Congress uh, to help us just revamp and deal with a broken in, in, in many different ways, including this, to help us revamp and actually fix a broken system. We have asked Congress to do that from day one. Uh, remember, the president put forth a comprehensive immigration reform uh, legislation. So this is something that the president has made a priority. The first piece of legislation that he put forward dealt with the immigration system. Again, this is something that, this is, when it comes to the system, the president wants to do this in a humane way. Uh, and he has taken actions uh, to work on this issue on his own without the help, uh, certainly, from Republicans in Congress. Um, I also 
also wanted to ask you, Administrator Chris Well, when she was here yesterday, talked about, and again today, about the rise of extreme weather, this idea of FEMA having to deal with an unprecedented workload. Is the President thinking about it all outside of your funding request to Congress? Um, any changes in its structures within the White House, any changes within agencies that would help support what we're seeing, which is more extreme weather, more often, more people needing help? I mean, I, I, don't have, I don't have anything to share about structure within the administration, but I would say this. Oh, I mean, look, I, I'll say this. Um, uh, we've asked for $12 billion, right? Uh, FEMA has asked for, for FEMA to continue to doing its work. That conversation is going to continue. Obviously, she, the, the uh, administrator laid out uh, what that means uh, for, uh, for her work. Uh, as it relates to extreme weather, one of the reasons the president has called the climate change a crisis and done the work, historic work that he's done on dealing with climate change is because of that, right? Is because we're seeing this change of pattern. We're seeing how rapidly and how quickly uh, this, uh, this extreme weather uh, hurricanes are coming about. That's what the administrator just said. And so, uh, look, there's a lot of work to do. The president has taken this very, very seriously. Uh, that's why the Inflation Reduction Act was so critical and important. The biggest investment in dealing with climate change. That's why the bipartisan, uh, the bipartisan uh, um, uh, infrastructure law is so important. So this is work that the president is going to continue to do to deal with an issue that is a crisis, uh, not just here but globally, uh, as it relates to any changes within the administration. I don't have anything for you on that. But right behind you, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, the uh, Afghanistan withdrawal ended two years ago uh, this week. Does President Biden plan to commemorate the events uh, and the people who were killed and left behind uh, as that happened? So as you know, uh, the President put, uh, had a statement uh, recently uh, when it came to the anniversary of Abbey Gate. Uh, so just want to state this as it was stated in the President's uh, uh, statement that we'll for, forever honor the memory of the 13 service members who were uh, stolen. Uh, far too soon from their families, loved ones, and brothers and sisters in arms uh, while performing a noble mission on behalf of our nation. And the First Lady, certainly the President, uh, and our entire nation will always support uh, those families. And so, look, the President has said on many occasions that ending our longest uh, war after 20 years was the right thing to do. Uh, he refused to send another generation, you've heard him say this, uh, of Americans to fight a war that should have ended a long time ago. America is no longer uh, is is uh, is no longer there. Obviously, uh, it is uh, on a stronger footing, uh, more capable to to meet our security needs around the world because we are not fighting a ground uh, on a ground uh, a ground war in Afghanistan, and we continue to put our assure uh, to put pressure on Al Qaeda and ISIS K while also focusing on terrorist threats elsewhere. And so that's going to be the president's focus to make sure that our homeland is protected, that Americans uh, are protected. Protected, and that's what the president's focus is going to continue to be. I have one, I have one more question. Go ahead. A question about North Korea, the missile launch earlier this morning. Anything you can say about that? And then also, uh, we heard about increased cooperation between the Russians and the North Koreans uh, with respect to weapons for the Russians. I'm wondering if uh, the president would consider meeting with Kim Jong un because of this increased uh, cooperation, and he can't seem to get a response from the North Koreans. So a couple of things, and I know my colleagues uh, spoke to uh, spoke to. Uh, this is uh, Russia and North Korea uh, just recently during a gaggle. So uh, just to reiterate uh, what he said. Uh, is uh, in part due to the success of U.S. sanctions and export controls. Uh, you know, Russia has been forced to turn to rogue regimes like the DPRK uh, to try to obtain weapons and equipment to support its military operations in, uh, in Ukraine. We have previously warned that Russia is actively seeking to acquire additional munitions from the DPRK. Today, uh, as my colleagues shared, we shared new information that arms negotiations between Russia and the DPRK are actively advancing. Uh, Russia's minister of Defense recently traveled to the DPRK to try to convince uh, Pyongyang to sell artillery ammunition to Russia. And our information indicates that following that visit, another group of Russian officials traveled, traveled there for follow-up on discussions about potential arms deals. Any arms 
arms deal between the DPRK and Russia would directly violate a number of UN uh, Security Council res resolutions. We urge the DPRK to cease its arms negotiations with Russia, and we are uh, taking action directly to exposing and sanctioning individuals and entities working to facilitate arm deals between Russia and the DPRK. So we will continue to identify, expose, and counter Russia attempts to acquire military equipment from the DPRK or any other states that is prepared to support its uh, to support its war in Ukraine as it relates to the, to the missile we condemn. Uh, we've been very clear about this, condemn the P DPRK's latest ball ball ballistic missile launch. Uh, this launch is in violation of multiple U United Nations Security Council resolutions and possesses a threat to the DPRK's neighbors and international community. We remain committed to a diplomatic approach uh, to the DPRK and call on DPRK to engage in dialogue, as we have. Uh, for some time now. Uh, our commitment to the defense of the Republic of Korea, Japan remains ironclad. Uh, any specifics on that, I would refer you to indo and for, uh, for any additional comment, and I just don't have anything else to add on that. To your calls for engagement, would the president consider a meeting? I just don't have a meeting to, to speak to at this time, but look, we are, we just don't have anything to share on that at this time. What I can say is that we are, we are, our, our lines of communication is open. Uh, we've been very clear on that. Uh, I just don't have anything to to share on a potential meeting. With that, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Greg.